session. And uh, once again, we'll have two talks and then we'll have general discussion. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just, okay. Uh, so uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, um, thanks Matt for organizing. This is really exciting. Uh, I'm looking forward to for the discussion. This is a uh, joint work with Dan, Benjamin who's here and Alex uh, Rhys Jones who's here and Miles Kimball who's now actually at Warwick talking I think to Andrew Wassold about happiness. Uh, the title is Can Marginal Rates of Substitution Be Inferred from Happiness Data? Uh, evidence from residency choices. So I'll really talk a little bit for a few minutes about marginal rates of substitution, remind what it is for non-economists, and then I'll talk a little bit about happiness data or inferences from happiness data, and then I'll talk about uh, actual data. So I'm not a philosopher, I actually go out and collect data. Uh, and so we'll talk about the residency, cho the evidence. Um, so what are marginal rates of substitution? This is an intuitive definition. The marginal rate of substitution is the rate at which substitution of one good for another would leave an individual indifferent. And my leading example today would be inflation and, <coughs> inflation and unemployment. Both are bad things. Um, if uh, we keep inflation as it is now and reduce unemployment by 1%, probably we'll make uh, ourselves better off. Um, so there is some percent of inflation that we could increase when we decrease unemployment by 1%, at which we will be as well off as without that. And so we can keep increasing inflation, maybe a 3 or 4% increase of inflation. It's equivalent to a 1% decrease in unemployment. That would be the marginal rate of substitution between inflation and unemployment. It would be 4 to 1 or, or 3 to 1 or whatever. Um, why did I pick this example? Uh, one of many papers, uh, this is just uh, by uh, serious people and uh, in, uh, very well published, uh, where uh, happiness data is used to estimate uh, mar MRS, MRS, marginal rate of substitution. So the, the, the title of the paper is very telling. The paper is about preferences, right, over inflation and unemployment. You couldn't be more explicit than that. But the evidence is from surveys of happiness. And the question that this paper asks is uh, suggested by the title, can you actually do that? Can you inform yourself from... Uh, happiness data on preferences. This is the main question that we're asking uh, through MRS. So um, here's another look at, at uh, MRS. Uh, ignore this uh, line for now, the dashed line. But you're in a world of two goods. So this is uh, low unemployment, uh, low inflation, both good things. And you have some preferences, well-behaved preferences over them. And this would be the ISO utility curve. Along this curve, you're indifferent. And so at a certain point A, the slope of the curve would be the MRS, the marginal rate of substitution. Really, how much do I have to compensate you with one good to give you the other? Now, uh, people who use happiness data to learn about uh, preferences essentially assume that the ISO, I'll call it the ISO SWB curve for subjective well-being, but the ISO happiness curve coincides with the ISO utility curve. So if you took happiness data and you tried to, to estimate the rate of trade-off and I'll distinguish in the talk, I'll, when it's happiness-based, I'll call it the rate of trade-off. When it's choice-based, I'll call it the MRS. The question is, are they the same? Well, if the two curves coincide, they are the same, but uh, they, they don't necessarily, so philosophically, there, are no, there is no reason to assume that they coincide, right? It could be that uh, how much inflation uh, should go up to leave me as happy or as satisfied with my life or on the same... Uh, country led the wrong. It could be that it's a different uh, rate than the rate that I would choose. And uh, again, this is another way to look at the project. What we're trying to ask, are they the same or not? And can we say something about the differences? So, um, so I talked about MRSs. Let me say something about happiness-based trade-offs. Uh, you take a happiness question everybody's familiar with. This is a life satisfaction question from the Eurobarometer. Um, and um, you use it to estimate MRSs where choice data are unavailable. So the, the inflation and unemployment is a good example. We cannot estimate it from choice data because people don't choose between pairs of inflation and unemployment typically. But what we can do is we do observe people under different regimes have uh, inflation and unemployment combinations in different countries in different times. So we can look at their life satisfaction, regress it on 
the levels of, of inflation and unemployment, and then the ratio between the coefficients in the regression would be the rate of trade-off, uh, the SWB-based rate of trade-off. So there are a lot of papers that do it with inflation and unemployment. I gave one example, but you could look at the rate of trade-offs of, of your own income versus others' income. You could try to price death. How much more income do I have to give you to compensate you for a death in the family? And you could price noise and the floods and etc. So a lot, big literature that does that. Um, and, um, and again, the, the, the question we'll ask is to what extent or could you interpret this as, as the MRF and not just as the rate of trade-off yeah, that is SWB based. So how are we going to do it? So, um, uh, so to do it, we're going to collect data. We're going to look for a choice situation where uh, choice arguably reveals preferences. So it's well informed, it's a cold state, a deliberate, etc. Um, then we're going to do two, uh, three things. We're going to first elicit a choice. So we're going to uh, elicit uh, uh, real choices over different <laughs> bundles of goods. Then we're going to also elicit anticipated subjective well-being, happiness, life satisfaction, the country letter, under each of the possibilities in the choice set. Okay, so we'll have a choice ranking. We'll have the ranking implied by different SWB questions. And the last thing that we will elicit, uh, we will elicit the expected bundle of goods the, the consumption vector under each of the options. So we will end up with a bunch of bundles. We know what is expected to be the goods in each bundle. We know the choice ranking of an individual uh, of, the, of, the, of the options, of the bundles, <coughs> and we know the anticipated subjective well-being of the bundles. And then we can regress either choice on the expected levels on the bundle is supposedly uh, uh, getting us the MRSS, or we could replace the dependent variable in the regression with anticipated subjective well-being under each of the options at the moment of making the choice, uh, getting a SWB-based trade-offs, and then we're just going to compare them. So this is going to be the exercise. Uh, in principle, very simple. In the rest, I'll just show you a little bit uh, how we do it. So first of all, the context, we, uh, we looked for a context where, as I said, the choice is uh, deliberate, called state, etc. We decided to look at the medical students' residency choice. Medical students in the US on their fourth year, they have to apply for uh, residencies. Residency is a period where they will uh, get uh, hands-on training in, a sp in their specialty. Um, they participate in the US in the national uh, resident in our national resident matching program, which uh, means they submit their ranking, their preference ranking over a bunch of residencies where they interviewed. Schools also submit their rankings over candidates. It all goes to a national clearinghouse, and then matches uh, are produced. It's incentive compatible, and this is what Al Roth uh, just got the Nobel for his related work. So it's nice. We, we know that people have an incentive to actually not lie. Uh, it's deliberated, well-informed, it's private, etc. It has a lot of desirable properties that make it for us an ideal uh, setup. We, um, email, we emailed uh, essentially a few months before the 2012 match. We emailed essentially all the schools in the medical schools in the US asking them to survey their students. 23 schools agreed. Eventually, we ended up with uh, uh, 561 participants who filled our survey. Now, um, here is what happened. We asked them to fill up a survey at 9 a.m. on February 22nd, which is when the residency match deadline closed. And we elicited uh, what I said before. First, we asked them, what did you rank in the NRMP submission? But just we focused on the top four programs. And then on each of the programs, in random order, in, in random order, we asked them to, to what they expect. If you got into that residency, what would be your happiness, life satisfaction, etc. And we also elicited what we call uh, residency attributes. I'll give you an example in, in a second. 
So that's the timeline of the survey. We also asked them, by the way, when did you submit for the, for the match, for the NRMP? And you can see, so the median, I just reported here, the median time between uh, the actual submission and filling our, our survey is just 11 days. So we consider it all under the same choice set. We, we had also a repeat survey, which I'm not going to talk about today. It's in the paper. So this is what it looks like. Uh, people do the survey. They click a link. They get some instructions. And then first we ask them, please enter the top four programs from the preference ordering you submitted to the NRMP. And they give us, for example, number one is John Hopkins uh, Specialties uh, Anesthesiology. And then we rotate in random order over the four choices and about each one of them, you probably can't see it, but uh, we ask them, for example, uh, not for example, we ask them thinking about how life would be if you matriculate into the residency program in uh, anesthesiology uh, at John Hopkins, please answer the questions below. On a scale of from one to 100, how happy do you think you would feel on a typical <coughs> uh, day during this residency? Uh, Etc. So we have what we ask them is a uh, three subjective well-being questions. Is this? I can. I think this is a PDF. You have to use the. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we ask them three. I'll point, and you guys will just calculate the angle yeah. between my hand, and you'll know where the laser should have hit. <laughs> um, so we're going to so we're going to elicit uh, expected happiness, expected life satisfaction, expected leather. And then we're going to ask them also about different features of the residency that based on conversations with uh, medical students, etc., cetera, uh, came up as the most important determinants of this kind of choice. So residency for student status, social life during the residency, anxiety, stress, future career prospects, etc. cetera. Um, then what we're, uh, we're going to do, as I said before, we're going to either regress choice on expected levels of this, and, uh, and get from that the MRSs, or regress the ranking implied by their answers to one of the SWB questions, and uh, get from that the trade-offs, the SWB-based trade-offs, and then compare them. Clarification. Yes. So you're, you're, you see all the bottom you lump together as, as what you're calling? I lump them for you. Uh -huh. In the survey, they were all mixed together as 12 questions. No, in, in the regression. Yeah. The top ones, the three, you're calling the yeah, subject so well-being, and the bottom ones, you're not? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, okay, we can get back to it. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. yeah. But uh, this doesn't have any uh, philosophical reason. The only reason is we chose these three because there is a wide literature that uses these specific questions yeah. as a choice substitute. So, we're asking what would happen if you replace choice with them in the regressions. But in principle, you could pick any one of these and regress it on the others. And we do a little bit of that uh, as robustness, but uh, let me skip this. So this is the basic result. I'll show it uh, graphically in a second, but uh, we just, I'm, I'm just going to show you, sorry, I'm, I'm going to show a regression. So when choice is the dependent variable, and we regress it, and we're using uh, something that looks like a logit uh, model, but it's generalized for more than two options. It's called a rank ordered logit. Um, we're regressing it on the coefficients, on the, on the what I call attributes, the nine attributes. So here we regress choice. Here we regressed happiness during the residency. Now I'll show everything in a second graphically. Let me just uh, point how to read this table. Uh, look at the first uh, row, first column. So residency for student status coefficient is 1.4 on choice. It means uh, with our normalization of the coefficient that uh, on average, um, residency prestige and status is 1.4, uh, the average importance that a, resi that a feature would get in choice, in the choice regression. Um, it gets zero in the happiness during residency. So one way to say it is, if a respondent expects a residency to have more prestige and status than other residencies, that's not going to be correlated with that respondent's ranking of more. They, they, they think that in this residency I'll have more prestigious status. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that they think they will be happier on that residency. It does, think, it, it does mean, however, strongly they're more likely to choose this residency. Okay, so for prestigious status, um, 
we would say that the SWB-based estimates underweight the importance of procedure status. People knowingly, deliberately say, it won't make me happier, I'm still going to choose it. And we have the opposite here. So a uh, second line, social life during the residency. People think that it will make them actually happier during the residency. It makes sense. But they give it much less uh, weight in choice. So for some things uh, overweighted in, uh, subject, in, expected, in anticipated SWB relative to choice, and some things are underweighted, um, one way to look at this graphically, you can look at the whole column and to say, you know, how different or similar it is. Um, so you could put this choice on the x-axis and put, for example, happiness on the y-axis. And then look at how far things are from the 45 degree line. And this is what we're doing here. So just look at this one. Choices at the, at the x-axis, we have nine points, which are <coughs> the nine coefficients. A happiness during residence is on the y-axis, and you see that things are pretty far from the 45 degree line. To give you some quantity, what do I mean by pretty far? Well, uh, the dashed lines show you if you're uh, above or below by a factor of two or more. So if the coefficient is half or twice, you'll fall uh, outside, and you often fall outside with a happiness measure. Uh, at the same time, notice there are no sign reversals, so, so things uh, and things are highly correlated. Uh, here the correlation is uh, 0.7. Um, this is the same, uh, the same exercise, choice again on the x-axis, but here I put the life satisfaction measure, and you can see that things move in. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's closer to choice, and statistically we discuss in the paper, but life satisfaction does a better job. And this is the letter question. So letter and life satisfaction, we can distinguish. They do a better job than happiness. Uh, here we did some, uh, we constructed some ind indices that I'm, I, I'm not going to have time to talk about. I'll talk about later, maybe. Um, but the bottom line from the indices is um, they don't do better than the single question, than the evaluative measures like satisfaction or, or leather, which do uh, much better than the affective uh, happiness. Uh, we have a lot of robustness uh, uh, checks in the article, we think about halo effect, cognitive dissonance, it will make you, you know, uh, report things that look more choice-like than perhaps if we didn't elicit your cho the choice uh, before. And other things, uh, we have the repeat survey, as I said, measurement error. There is the indices. This is just advertising the paper, right? I don't have time to talk about them. Okay, let me uh, close with conclusions and then uh, try to tie it a little bit to the well-being, uh, to the index that we discussed before, started discussing. So, uh, some practical implications. So, we, we have some findings and we try to translate them to practical implications if you do want to use uh, happiness um, um, to learn about preferences. So, first of all, uh, the happiness-based uh, trade-offs are not the same as marginal rates of substitution. Don't assume that they are the same. Um, at the same time, it could be that uh, in bi binary comparisons, if you're just comparing two policy options, it could be that you'll get the direction right. So you'll get that A is preferred to B, also people are happier under A than B. You can get that, and we discuss in the paper theoretically and empirically, even without getting the slopes the same. So in the, in the figure that I showed be, be, be before, even when the slopes are not the same, for, for, for not, not for pricing things, but for at the margin, but for just comparing policy options, you might still get things uh, correct. Um, the evaluative measures do better than, uh, than happiness in our data, and we have uh, two previous papers with uh, hypothetical choices that are consistent with that. So we, we think that evaluative measures, when you compare them to choice or to hypothetical choice, to stated preferences, uh, they seem to be doing better than happiness. Uh, and the last thing is uh, that is consistent finding in this and in other papers is the measure of family happiness. In this, in this paper, we had something about desirability for significant other. Seems to be extremely doing extremely well if your if your measure is uh, is uh, is choice. And this is an underdeveloped measure. We always uh, ask about people's happiness, people's well-being. Uh, we think that looking at family's well-being actually might get us uh, some mileage. The big caveat, where I'm also going to cite uh, Matt's uh, no longer forthcoming paper, <laughs> um, 
Remember, of course, this is just uh, one uh, set of data. It's not, a, it's not a random sample. It's only one context, etc. And, of course, on top of that, we only looked at one necessary uh, condition there for, for being able to interpret these things as uh, MRSs, but there's a list of other assumptions that uh, applications typically require that we didn't even touch. And look at Matt's paper. Well, you'll hear about Matt's okay. paper in a second. So um, I want to say what, how much do I have? This is zero, so I'll just grab it. OK, okay so I'll, I'll get back to it uh, maybe in the discussion. So that's. That's all for now. You said a zero, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be under you. Under you to Thank you for uh, listening to this uh, presentation. Yeah, now out uh, in the uh, Duke Law Journal. I apologize for some people in the room who've already heard this, so feel free to zone out. There's nothing new. Um, okay, so this is uh, more for an audience which is not already intimately aware about this, you know, now vibrant uh, literature on happiness. As everyone here knows, there's this huge literature now that looks to. Uh, uh, the correlation between uh, uh, happiness, you know, or SWB, subjective well-being, uh, measured using uh, one or another question, life satisfaction, happiness, and um, uh, uh, lots of other uh, attributes. Uh, Kahneman, you know, uh, as if uh, winning the Nobel Prize for prospect theory and, and reference dependent was, was not enough at the end of his life or, you know, later in his professional life uh, now focuses on happiness. He's interested in using uh, measures of momentary happiness as opposed to uh, global happiness. Um, uh, uh, has done theoretical work uh, uh, trying to come up with a, uh, uh, the basis for a measure of momentary happiness and also empirical work uh, looking at moment to moment uh, happiness. Uh, again, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the thrust of this uh, um, uh, paper is going to be somewhat skeptical, but I should not be understood as being at all skeptical about the importance of, you know, uh, uh, all of the empirical stuff that we've learned from this literature. I mean, this is hugely important uh, for uh, policy, uh, seeing what does and does not correlate uh, with SWB, starting with Easterlin and the relation between happiness and income, uh, uh, this big literature which shows just how important employment seems to be. Uh, for happiness, um, Stevenson and Wolfers on um, uh, uh, what's happened to female happiness in the United States um, uh, since uh, uh, the move toward gender equality, adaptation. I mean, all that stuff is really important for policy, uh, and my skepticism it is not at all targeted at that. Okay, so what I'm more interested in here um, is the use of this, uh, uh, and again, I'll just say happiness, but I mean SWB uh, data for uh, public policy. Um, as one tiny part of this vast literature uh, on happiness, but the part which is growing at a, at a fairly fast rate, um, there are dozens, you know, probably 50 now, uh, academic papers that use happiness data uh, to estimate monetary equivalents for various goods and bads. And I should say, I mean, I'm originally a scholar of cost-benefit analysis, and cost-benefit analysis is centered on monetary equivalents, right? What cost-benefit analysis does like it or not, is to look at all manner of goods, non-market goods, health, the risk of death, environmental goods, and try to come up with a monetary equivalent. Now, there's a standard um, or a standard set of techniques for doing that. Jonathan alluded to that earlier, revealed preference techniques, uh, stated preference techniques, which are surveys. Uh, this new literature uses happiness data to come up with monetary equivalents. And what it does is exactly this notion of an MRS that Ori was talking about. Right? It, it specifically tries to use these happiness uh, surveys to estimate an MRS between some other good, air quality, airport noise, you know, so forth, and money. 
right? And once we estimate that trade-off rate, and specifically that trade-off rate is the ratio between the coefficients, so we look at someone's income and their level of this non-market good as one of the various independent variables in regression, we then take the ratio of the coefficients, which is basically the trade-off rate in terms of producing happiness of income as opposed to the non-market good, and we use that to estimate monetary equivalence. This is now being done. This is now being done. Indeed, uh, you know, uh, Paul Dolan and co-authors uh, 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 have tried to uh, develop systematic guidance uh, for uh, cost-benefit practitioners in the UK for doing this. All right, so this is a specific example, probably the most important example of how this happiness data is being used for policy purposes. Um, uh, there's also, uh, you know, a lot of academic work and interest now in terms of gross national happiness, right, coming up with actual measures of, of gross national happiness to make either cross-national comparisons uh, or looking at time trends in uh, 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 gross national happiness within a country or within a region and so forth. Um, you know, there, there are technical differences between these two. So to do this, you need an ordinal measure. To do, to do this, you need a cardinal measure. But basically, they're both, you know, in various ways using this happiness data uh, uh, for policy purposes. Uh, 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 a bunch of law professors, uh, uh, John Bronstein, have come up with this idea of well-being analysis. We talk about that. Uh, as well as governmental efforts. Um, uh, Carol Graham, uh, 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 maybe others in this room were on uh, an NAS panel uh, uh, looking at the use of happiness uh, 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 data in the U.S. This is already being done uh, in uh, the U.K. Uh, George can tell us about that. Uh, um, so there's a lot of um, uh, activity. All right, so here is where I want to um, uh, throw cold water a bit, or at least lukewarm water, on all this exciting stuff uh, um, and say let's just be a little more uh, careful. Um, and the paper really has two aims, one more important than the other. I mean, the more important aim is conceptual, which is to say, now that we have moved from just doing empirical work to doing normative work, in particular to saying that as a normative matter, these are useful, you know, or happiness-based measures are useful as a matter of public policy, we need to engage in a kind of normative precision about the relevant concepts that philosophers, you know, do, but that economists and psychologists and so forth don't do, just because for, you know, for, for, for purely empirical purposes you don't need to do that. But if we're being normative, let's be a little more careful about our concepts. So, you know, Easterlin, and again, Easterlin is a pioneer, right? I mean, for purposes of doing empirical work, to say that the terms happiness, subjective well-being, satisfaction, utility, well-being and welfare are just the same thing, that may be fine. Right? If we're just up against you know, uh, the question of prediction. But as a normative matter, these are different concepts. And we should be uh, careful. In particular, we should be careful not to conflate subjective well-being or happiness, which are purely experiential concepts, I take it. These are simply a matter of what's going on in someone's head, as opposed to well-being, which philosophers say is a matter of how well life is going for someone. Conceptually, it's not conceptually confused to say, that someone's well-being can be changed by events outside our head. We might decide as a substantive matter to be experientialist, but at least conceptually we should be careful not to conflate well-being with something which is purely uh, experiential. Um, so mainly I want to draw that conceptual distinction and also, uh, uh, you know, secondarily to suggest that we should be skeptical about uh, using happiness surveys in policy design. We have to look closely at the different uses uh, and, and I want to be uh, skeptical. Okay, so the, the map of the paper, and again, this is, you know, um, I do think this is a useful uh, distinction. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, I think it's important to distinguish between the use of happiness surveys as evidence of preference utility, and again, I'll say more in my limited time about this, uh, 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 as opposed to... Uh, the idea that these happiness surveys are useful as evidence of experience utility, right? And preference utility is a measure of the extent to which someone's preferences are realized. Um, that's not the same as experience utility, meaning a measure of the quality in some sense of someone's experiences, right? And thinking about the policy rele relevance of happiness surveys, we should distinguish between these two, right? Let's not conflate them. Let's look at these separately. 
And within the latter category, we should distinguish between the kind of the strong view, right, for which, you know, originally Bentham and now Richard Layard, uh, two great Brits, are famous, which says, you know, well-being is just a matter of experiences. Um, and the weaker view uh, uh, that Dan was offering earlier and that Kahneman now adopts, which says that, well, you know, what goes on in your head is not the only aspect of your well-being necessarily, uh, but it's at least one substantial component. And in turn, on this kind of weak experientialist view, um, uh, happiness surveys are uh, 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 evidence of uh, uh, experiences as one input into policy. All right, so let, let's go through these. And my, again, just to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, not to bury the lead, I am skeptical about this. I mean, this is, I think in lots of ways what I'm saying is similar to what Dan was saying. Dan was skeptical about the use of life, satis life satisfaction measures as measures of the extent to which someone's values are realized. That's exactly what I'm saying here. I'm skeptical about using uh, uh, happiness surveys as evidence of preference realization or, to put it in, in, in Dan and, uh, uh, and Ori's uh, terms, as evidence of MRSs with respect to choice. Right? Uh, I'm skeptical of the strong experience utility view just because that's Experientialism, right? That adopts a kind of Benthamite or quasi-Benthamite view which says that well-being is just a matter of what goes on in your head. I'm most open to the kind of weak view which says that happiness surveys are evidence of someone's experience utility in turn just one input into policy. But here, and we can come back now to the questions of scaling that were on the table in the morning, even if one adopts this view, which I think to be the most plausible, we have to think carefully about what the right measure is. Right? And what's going to be the most useful, both practical you know, and right in some sense measure uh, to be integrated into uh, policy. Okay, so um, I'll quickly walk through those different uh, parts of the uh, paper. Preference view of well-being. This is, uh, of course, the classical view within uh, welfare economics. Uh, it's also... Uh, uh, it's a view which is well represented uh, philosophically. Peter can uh, tell us about that. Rawls actually, although Rawls is not most famous for this, but Rawls um, uh, does, uh, in theory of justice, I take it, uh, uh, adopt a kind of a preference uh, view of uh, welfare. What's a preference? Well, I'm using preference in a quite minimal sense. A preference is a ranking of outcomes. It's got you know, some basic formal properties. I think most people are going to say that the ranking has got to be complete. I'm oh, sorry, the ranking has got to be transitive. Maybe it doesn't have to be complete, maybe not. At a minimum, it's got to be transitive. But it's like, you know, a minimally well-behaved ranking of outcomes, which is connected, in, uh, you know, uh, in some way to uh, uh, someone's choices. One can talk about actual preferences, or as earlier, we can talk about well-informed preferences. But that's what a preference is. If that's what a preference is, it's just straightforward that someone can have a preference, and not just an instrumental preference. Right? I can have an instrumental preference you know, to drink this right now, not because I love the taste of this stuff, because I'm thirsty. Right? But it's also possible that someone can have an intrinsic preference, a preference for the thing in itself, for attributes other than her own mental states. Right? If you think of a preference as just a choice-connected ranking of outcomes, there's nothing in that which says that the only thing someone can intrinsically prefer is what goes on in her own head. Um, and indeed, if you look at classical consumer theory, right, if you look at, you know, uh, uh, um, you know a textbook uh, uh, in economic theory, for example, people have preferences over commodity bundles, right? People have preferences over commodity bundles, which are summarized in a preference over income. But on that view, the intrinsic, uh, you know, object of preference is not a mental state. It is a consumption of one or another commodity. And then we can talk about the, you know, whether those are well-behaved and so forth and you know, transitive and, and complete and continuous. But you know, there is the theory not just allows, but indeed it supposes their preferences are preferences over commodity bundles. Now, you might say, well, that's crazy. That's a preference, but in some sense, it's not an intelligible preference. Right? But one of the things I go through in the paper is that even if one says that the relevant preferences should be not just preferences in this middle sense, but intelligible preferences and indeed uh, self-interested preferences, Right? There's nothing to say that someone can't have an intelligible, self-interested preference for something than our own mental states. And I can, you know, we talk about this more, but it seems to me that, for example, preferences for health, for liberty, uh, for relationships, and so forth, uh, uh, where the intrinsic preference is for that thing, not for feelings about the thing or beliefs about the things, that that could be 
uh, uh, or that is intelligible and self-interested. And a nose experience machine, in, in, you know, in, in effect, uh, is a way to see that point. Now, although the point I'm making here is weaker than nose experience machine, right? Most people probably know about that. Uh, uh, thought experiment, Nozick says, you know, imagine being able to enter into a machine which will give you experiences of whatever you want. You won't actually have the thing, just the experience. And he says, it's crazy to step in. You shouldn't step in. What I'm saying is actually something weaker, which is that um, uh, it, it's rational, it's permissible, it's rationally permissible not to step in. I mean, maybe you want to step in, that's fine, but someone could have a preference not to step in. Someone could have a preference that says, I intrinsically prefer things other than beliefs, feelings, experiences, and so therefore I'm not going to step in. I mean, the nice thing about a preference-based view, and this again I think is you know, overlooked or uh, not fully understood in this literature, is that the preference view is not paternalistic, right? What is good for someone on this view depends on what she prefers, and that's, that can change. That can vary from person to person, right? And it's possible that someone might have strong intrinsic preference for mental attributes, but it's also possible that someone might have a strong preference for various kinds of uh, non-mental attributes. And a utility function, in turn, is just a mathematical representation of a preference structure. Right? So if someone has RI just says, X and Y are outcomes, RI just says, you know, individual I has a preference for X over Y. Uh, and again, I want to say that preference possibly can have these various non-mental attributes as intrinsic determinants. A utility function, in turn, is just a measure of that. It just mathematically represents that. Um, there's no entailment here that someone, you know, uh, uh, know what her utility is. Someone might be confused, right? So, for example, someone might have an intrinsic preference not to be uh, deceived by a spouse, right? Uh, if that's your intrinsic preference, then your utility is higher. In a world where you have a faithful relationship as opposed to a world where you don't, even though you're not aware of that. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go quickly over this. But again, so, so, so conceptually, someone can, and I want to say as a matter of intelligibility and self-interest, someone can have an intrinsic preference for things other than their own mental states. That's not to say that she cares only about non-mental attributes, but just that this is one of the ingredients in the mix. Um, one of the things which I think is dramatically understudied by the literature, and I think uh, uh, Ori and Dan's uh, uh, analysis uh, a paper is a wonderful contribution here, is to look empirically at the extent to which people care about their own happiness as opposed to other attributes. I mean, let's distinguish what this literature does, the existing literature does, uh, unhappiness is to look at the extent to which various attributes are correlated with happiness or feeling of satisfaction or what have you. That is not the same as asking to what extent do people prefer being happier as opposed to other attributes. That's what you guys are getting at. And actually, as far as you know, I can tell, there's very little uh, scholarship on that. If it were to turn out that in general people just intrinsically prefer their own happiness as an empirical matter, then maybe we could use that as the basis for policy making. But there's no evidence of that. I mean, we, that has not been sufficiently studied. And to the extent that it has been studied, as in this paper, um, uh, as in a uh, preliminary paper I did with Paul Dolan and in some other work, it, it just does not seem to be the case that people empirically you know, uh, care only about uh, uh, their own uh, happiness. How are we doing? OK, so back to where we are. Just so. Preferences, you know, can have uh, both uh, non-mental as well as mental fundamental arguments, the things that people intrinsically prefer. Empirically, it seems to be possible for people to intrinsically prefer things other than their own happiness, their health, relationships, knowledge, uh, and so forth. And then the question is, so given that preferences are in part for non-mental things, can we use these happiness surveys as evidence of preference utility? Right? Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, on a preference based view of well being, do these uh, surveys provide good evidence of MRSs in the preference sense? Um, and here I want to say this is quite problematic. Right? Now, the thought experiment, again, doing this in terms of cost benefit, which is where the stuff has mainly been used. Um, you know, this is the way I think, uh, or an example that makes clear exactly what's being presupposed about preferences and scaling and so forth, right? 
So imagine that Amy currently has a certain amount of income, Y, and a certain level, Z, of some non-income attribute. And what we're trying to figure out is her willingness to pay for a change. That is, if her, the non-income attribute goes up by delta Z, what is the amount, the maximum amount, uh, delta Y, which she is willing to have subtracted from her income uh, and still be either better off or equally well off, right? That's what cost-benefit is about. Now, if we're using these happiness surveys to make the inference, how might that go? Well, you might say, well, um, uh, Amy currently, currently has the bundle YZ of income and the non-income uh, good, uh, and Bob currently has the bundle uh, Y minus delta Y and Z plus delta Z, uh, and you say to Amy with her bundle, how satisfied are you with your life right now? And she says, seven. And you say to Bob, uh, how satisfied are you with, your you, you with your life right now? And he says, also seven. Can we infer that Amy and Bob have a common willingness to pay of delta Y for a change delta Z of the non-market attribute? And I think if one looks at this closely, the answer is, well, no. Or at least there are lots and lots of assumptions you'd have to make about they're having common preferences, about the scale they might use for those preferences, uh, about what they mean by a life satisfaction question before one could make that inference. All right. So I'm skeptical there. I'm skeptical uh, of uh, the use of happiness measures in the strong sense uh, as an experience utility measure uh, because I think it's philosophically problematic to think that well-being just as a matter of what goes on in someone's head. Um, I think the interesting conversation if one wants to use happiness as a kind of a supplement to state of preference studies, right, where state of preference studies are the standard way and reveal preference studies are the standard way to get a preference utility, right, now we need to have a careful conversation about how exactly we're going to measure experience utility. I think Kahneman has done a great service by putting a framework on the table, uh, but I think it's got lots of problems, and we can talk about that in Q&A uh, if you'd like. Thanks. We can. Yeah, um, I guess the chair's prerogative. I'll ask the first question. Absolutely. Um, so, what I, I, I agree with both of you in believing that most people, when they make their decisions, are thinking not just about their own subjective well being, whatever that is. Um, I think it's really important to think about how you consider other people's subjective well being in decisions you make. And that's a huge you know, thing to, to map, and I love that part of your study. I, I'm, um, I have two kind of concerns, Ori, about your analysis. One is kind of specific to the way, you, what you measured in this study, and, it, and it, I want to hear your general response to that, and then another is a little bit more general about that, your whole analytic approach, which you explained really beautifully, clearly. So my, my specific concerns are, so background is I'm a physician, so I did go through this matching process, you know, 20 years ago or something like that. Um, First off, you don't expect to be very happy in residency in general. Um, you know, it's going to be a miserable time. Um, but what you might do, and I don't, you don't know how, you, you had some measures that hinted at it, but not really directly, is you didn't get lifetime subjective well-being measures in it. This is an investment you're making of brutal minimum three years for broader, for life set goals. And I do think if you had that measure, you'd find out it still just wasn't about happiness. There's about contributing to society and the better training you get, etc. Right. Um, but I just think that it's a, it's a big mistake to say they didn't, that you can't compare choice and subjective well-being when your subjective well-being measure is how happy you're going to be during your residency when the reason you go into the residency is, a, is setting up your whole life. So that, that kind of issue I think is looms large. And then um, the second thing is just a more general comment. I, I like these, that general analysis where you look at choice and then you look at how subjective well-being uh, predicts it and show that there are other things that contribute, that have weight. Um, but there's anticipated subjective well-being and then there's experienced subjective well-being. And so I'm curious analytically whether there's anything you want to add to a model that not just looked at how people, when they make the choice, what they predict of subjective well-being will be because we know people mispredict that they can mispredict that a lot. But actually going and measuring, I, I thought you guys might actually get residency data and find out how accurate they were, it would have been kind of interesting. 
So that's my general comment. So these are great two questions because they were on the slides for a longer presentation and I took them out. So, so it gives me a chance to tell you more about the paper that I didn't have time before. So this is great. Um, on the time investment, so we actually have a section in the paper we discuss it. So um, you think of instantaneous utility. So this is instantaneous utility, and then we have a present discounted value of lifetime utility, which you know we discount all the future flow, the expected future flow, and uh, uh, and then we can think the same about uh, happiness. Same, for example, about happiness. So there is happiness on every given day, and then uh, I tr if if I try to maximize lifetime happiness, I will try to maximize this flow with a certain discount value. So one of the advantages of our context is that, in fact, it's an investment decision. Nobody goes to a residency to be happy there for five years. It's, so this is a context, this, this was one, I think it was in a word on, on the slide when I said advantages of this context. We can actually uh, compare, uh, in, so this is a context where instantaneous utility or utility in the next five years is not, a, Happy, instantaneous happiness is not necessarily the same as uh, lifetime happiness. So what we did there was two things. First of all, we elicited not just happiness, how happy will you be on a typical day during the residency. We had three more questions. I just didn't have uh, time to talk about it. We asked how happy do you expect you'd be on a typical day uh, in the, in the uh, first 10 years of your career after the residency, and then the same uh, until retirement, and then the mm -hmm. same after retirement. So we had four periods, and we tried to construct the index that would best, given the choice data, what in the, what weights do we have to put discounting factor on the different periods to get the maximum match with choice? So in a way, making it very easy on the happiness. Is there any set of weights of discounting that would exp explain choice? And uh, one of our conclusion was put the optimal uh, weights there, you will still get a, a much a, a worse index than just asking about life satisfaction or about a, a letter. So uh, we tried to do it, and it, it just didn't uh, work. Now you know we didn't ask about every single day in your life, but the, the, it's not. It's it's certain we can very easily reject that it's just uh, it's not uh, residency happiness, but it's happiness after or after retirement. Um, the second thing is that the, le uh, uh, the letter question is actually atemporal in a way. The letter question is, uh, I think Jennifer uh, talked about the continuation of, of, li of, of life starting basically today. Or, uh, so th that's basically what it is, right? They ask, uh, put, your li put the rest of your life on, on, on something. And, uh, and, uh, and the life satisfaction, on the other hand, we explicitly ask life satisfaction during the residency. And in fact, these two measures do give us the same thing. Now, interpretation, you could say uh, people cannot integrate even when you ask them, cannot time integrate. Or you could say even when you say during the residency they, tr they do integrate for the rest of the day. I, I don't know. I don't have evidence for that. But uh, that's the other piece of evidence. The last thing I'm so, – so in terms of empirics, we, 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 we looked at it. We can rule it out. Uh, in, in terms of use, I just want to point out that most of the applications – simply assume that instantaneous uh, happiness is a good measure of present discounted value of, uh, of lifetime uh, utility because what they do is they take the happiness question that is available in the survey and they price things, right? They measure the MRS with money. Essentially, an under, a necessary assumption is to assume that, that how happy were you yesterday in fact already captures the you know discounted happiness for the rest of your life and how happy I am reporting today already took into account all of this so people actually make this assumption without any problem in the empirical world um, on the other pa uh, the other point is also a great point because we have a, a, a discussion about it in the paper so you said uh, if I can rephrase what you asked you said uh, look this is all nice it's about anticipated happiness. But the applications are about experience happiness. They regress your answer to a question on the survey, not what you thought you would answer. So uh, two things. First of all, um, when we want for our exercise, I actually have to look at anticipated uh, and not at experience utility because I, 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 I want to identify deviations. If I looked at experience versus what you chose, 
versus how happy you felt a year later. Well, maybe they diverged because you mispredicted your happiness. You did try to maximize it, but you were wrong. Uh, so I want to know at the moment of choice, and this is why I emphasize the timeline. I want to know on the days, you know, a week after you made the choice, what do you think would make you happier? And to show you that you're not even trying to maximize that, mistakes alone. Now, uh, so that's a part, the part A of the answer. The, uh, the, the second part of the answer is, uh, you could logically, lo it's, it's a logical possibility to assume a world where mispredictions are always exactly canceling out the, 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 the divergences we found, right? So you always uh, ch ch choose things that differ from anticipated happiness in exactly the way that cancels it out. We just assume it away. That would be a very strange theory of, uh, you know, so. So but just, I mean, in terms of your anticipated lifetime well-being, right? So as I understand it, you, 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 you found the discount rate that maximizes concordance with choice, right? I mean, have you thought about doing it for all possible values of, of exponential discounting? I mean, that would be interesting to see whether um, the range of deviation, right? So uh, to I assume mean, a functional I, form... Well, on the assumption that exponential discounting is rational because it's time consistent, and then the question mm -hmm. is, you know, to what extent does it predict, you know? I mean, in a way, you, the, the, the current presentation by finding the discount rates that maximize concordance understates the divergence yeah. of anticipated yeah. lifetime well-being and choice. And we right? make a big fuss of it in so, the paper. I mean, we you, say, you could assume, we, I mean, you know, assume the basic exponential form. So that's then, a nice, okay, so this is a nice idea. Values. But this is a nice idea. Obviously, it wasn't our focus. So the, what, what we wanted to maximize it because we said, look, we are stacking the cards against ourselves. And right. still we find big deviations. But of course, if we assumed a certain uh, functional form, it would do you, you even worse. Right. And, and now it's, inter it's an interesting question. Are optimal weights, what functional form do they look like? Right. So we could, in a right. way, right. say right. something right. about that. Right. Yeah. Um, I guess it, it's sort of a comment that you made about the Based on the the, the uh, Matt's critique of the of the weight of the very um, of this of the layered stuff, uh, it's less of a pushback on the Kahneman stuff. But so the paper clearly shows very different. Ori and um, his co-author's paper, very which is a great paper, very clearly shows big differences in um, with a range on everything going from the choice values to happy yesterday or happy, you know, sort of temporarily happy to the, you know, the best possible life question. Um, so if you look at it, the happy's lowest on prestige, highest on social life. Um, choice is insignificant um, with stress and, you know, there's a big negative of stress on happy. So there's an increasing, even though, um, there are plenty of people out there now that, and I, I admit to have started this way because that's all we knew what to do 10 years ago, that just threw happiness or life satisfaction on the left-hand side of a regression and started to say this means X. The, the field has really developed where there's a very strong consensus that there are two distinct dimensions of well-being and one is evaluative, sort of how you think of your life as a whole, and that encompasses not today, it, sort of everything, your life, you know, your, your lifetime. Um, including your well beyond daily contentment. And then there's hedonic well-being, which is, you know, how stressed were you yesterday, how happy were you yesterday. Um, there are plenty of people out there, Richard Lair, Jeff Sachs now, just selling happiness as a metric. And then, like, for this well-being panel, we're discouraging even using the term happiness because it, it mixes and matches. And so it turns out that people score very differently, of course, on how they think about their life in the hedonic sense and the daily sense and how they think about their residency choice and their life as a whole. And your paper, I think, shows that beautifully. Um, and some of the work I'm going to present tomorrow does a little bit the same thing. And it even suggests that people who have more capabilities to make these big choices, like residents who can think about contributing to society and making their families happy, focus much more on the, the, the kind of evaluative side of things when they make choices and they sacrifice hedonic stuff, they're willing to take stress, versus people who don't have choices, don't have a choice except to think, okay, how's my day to day? I'm alive and you'd rather not be stressed, right? Um, so there, I think it's, um, 
certainly the measures are imprecise, and I wouldn't say that best possible life is a, you know, the, a great question, but it, it clearly, if you look at how it correlates with income, within countries, across countries, with all kinds of other capabilities, it correlates very strongly with people's capacity to make choices the kinds of choices that you're analyzing, and you look at hedonic measures, and they're all over the map, right? Because they, they, they just captured this daily affect and daily experience stuff. So um, anyway, I, th I mean, I think the paper really highlights that, and it might, in some other iteration, it might be worth maybe making that a bit more explicit, that at least a lot of the field is moving into very clear, um, you know, def distinctions between these kinds of these dimensions of well-being, and also very clear distinctions between negative and positive affect, and su suggesting that they they really mm -hmm. demonstrate different things. And you can have high levels of evaluative well-being coexisting with high levels of stress, and it shows up in your findings too, and and some of what I'll present tomorrow as well. Um, so that it's it's much more refined, and maybe that will make Matt a bit more comfortable about the usage of all this stuff versus just yeah throwing in some very not well articulated happiness question, and some of them are you happy yesterday, which is very much an, a, a kind of affect question. How happy are you with your life as a whole is a little closer to life satisfaction, and life satisfaction is a little closer to best possible life. So there's this whole range, and what question you use matters tremendously to how precise you are about a lot of these things and about people's preferences and life choices. Anyway, I went on too long, but it just... Any, any related comments or questions for these guys? Maybe, you yeah, know, somehow related. If there is any um, bias, any, the bias between the two is just white noise, so you can understand there is some structure. I mean, that's it. Let me just, I mean, quickly to Carol's question. I think, you know, Carol's been a pioneer here, and it's very important to, I'm using the word happiness, but I, by happiness I mean just the family of SWB, including EWB, evaluated well-being measures. So I want to say conceptually, <coughs> there's a difference between wanting certain things, having various goals. You know, so as a, as a scholar, my goal is to produce good scholarship. As a teacher, my goal is to be a good teacher. I want to have a family. I want to be in good health. There's a difference between wanting those things and wanting to feel like I have a worthwhile life, right? What I'm aiming at is not feeling satisfied with my life. I'm actually aiming at those things. And so if you said to me, we're going to, you know, do something to you that will make you feel more satisfied but also less productive, would you choose to do that? I would say no. No, I, I, what I want is, is to be a productive scholar. But I recognize that feeling dissatisfied actually, you know, uh, um, spurs my creativity, and I don't want to feel satisfied. I mean, I don't want to be miserable. But if above a threshold, I have a choice between doing more scholarship and feeling less satisfied and feeling more satisfied. Okay, so, so I want to say that conceptually, it's possible indeed, I think, you know, lots of people to some extent have preferences for things themselves as opposed to feeling uh, satisfied, feeling worthwhile, and so forth. Then we can have the conversation, which is the econometric conversation, which is, well, maybe <laughs> EWB measures are good enough measures of the extent to which people actually realize their intrinsic goals. I mean, that's possible. And then we have to worry about you know, whether it's just noise or whether there's systematic excuse and so forth. But that distinction, I mean, there's a tendency in this literature to assume that the eudaimonic view, the Aristotelian view, which says there are various objective things that are good for someone, as distinct from feelings of happiness or feelings of satisfaction, there's a tendency to subjectivize that notion, to say, well, that's just about feelings of purpose, and that's not what the view says. Um, so first to, to Carol. Um, we, so the, it is again a, a part of the paper that uh, I didn't have time to do. I just mentioned the indices. So I think one, one of the things that this paper does uh, for the first time to the best of our knowledge and, and, and uh, our previous papers didn't touch on is this issue of an index. So um, uh, if uh, experience happiness is one dimension of happiness and then the evaluation, life satisfaction or later is another, uh, if that's the entire theory that these are two, they are only it's a, it's a bi-dimensional uh, well-being. Then, in principle, we could find an index that consists of these two, and again, we will find weight the optimal weights from the data, the relative weights that will look like choice. So, in the paper, we try to do that. In fact, we we combine the happiness over the four periods with life satisfaction and with the with the ladder. We call it the six-measure index or something like that. Uh, and 
it, it doesn't do much better than just a life evaluation question. So uh, empirically, at least in this data, we actually looked at this hypothesis and we didn't find strong evidence uh, for getting the MRSs uh, better. Now, um, Dan, I thought it would be rolling over and writhing if you knew you were combining them all into an index because you're sort of mixing them up. Right. So, uh, so now the question is what, what does it mean to say that well-being is multidimensional? For us as economists, we say let's start simple. Let's just say that utility, what, you know, the utility function choice for us is really a function and a well-behaved function of more than one thing. So let's put their happiness and life satisfaction, etc. And locally, if we can, you know, under some well-behavedness assumptions, let's see if we can get the slopes uh, better. Now, um, the fact that we couldn't get better uh, tr trade-offs that look more like MRSs with a small index. This index is very simplistic, right? We took uh, six questions. Uh, in principle, though, if medical students are making rational choices when they uh, choose residencies, then there is a set of questions that would give you the right answer, right? Because in principle, there is some list of things that they consider and eventually they try to maximize. So, it may not be these three questions, but there could potentially be a very long list that if we got that right, we will be able to find the ways that in fact replicate choice. And so we have another project, actually, you know, you know the other, the well-being uh, index paper, we will try to do just that. So we, uh, uh, on a relatively small scale, we looked at uh, works from philosophy and psychology and, and economics, you know, not, there is a big body of literature, but we sampled uh, some important papers, and we put on the list all of the candidates that we thought somebody proposed as a candidate there. So, of course, happiness and life satisfaction, the paper is called Beyond Happiness and Life Satisfaction. Of course, the happiness and life satisfaction and later are there, but also a flow because Seligman thought that flow is important and, and self-actualization because Maslow said that self-actualization. And with this long list, we try to, uh, you know, estimate the weights there and get at an index. Uh, in principle, we think that this could be done. Um, practically, it may actually require that there, mi there might not be one, for sure there won't be a, qu a silver question. There probably won't be a four, you know, the, the four British question. It might be a hundred questions. So now, you know, our government's actually gonna do it, etc. but uh, you know, governments already do it with uh, GDP, right? So for GDP, they just count thousands and thousands of goods, and it requires many millions of dollars, etc., to get. They don't want to miss things, right? GDP cannot miss any little thing. So, in principle, if we want an index that is as reliable, mm -hmm. we may actually have to uh, identify all of the dimensions and put them in an index. And uh, you know, we, we we're trying now to do it a little bit. But uh, this gets back to my question: of, You know, what's your goal? goal is to show that when people make decisions, or it's your goal is to test, when people make decisions, are they c considering things other than subjective well-being? Your design works. If you're trying to talk about policy, why are you going to just get a better predictive model of what people do when they make choices, given the fact they might make bad choices? Why not? And if you think that well-being is one of the things that matters, I wouldn't care, I wouldn't care about the choice. I'd now look and see, well, let's just look at choices and look at different aspects, including evaluative aspects of well-being later and find out. So that's, right. that's the same answer, or it's a variant of the answer of why we use here a anticipated the subjective well-being and not actual one. If I could find in a design like this um, the vector uh, of things, the anticipated levels of which perfectly explain choice, right. in fact, I would go back and at least have some credibility in saying uh, these are the things that governments should yeah, but, maximize right, okay, expose because this is what people wanted yes. to. Gotcha. No, but, 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 but now, now we're back to again. I mean, yeah. I, I think I mean, this is an incredible piece of work. I think it's a great piece of work. Um, you're looking at intrapersonal, intrapersonal trade-offs, right? But the part of the point is if, if you know, so there are lots of things. I mean, you know, we're, we're preference types and preference types are great. But there's a big, you know, uh, gap in a preference theory, and that gap consists in interpersonal comparisons, right? So the index, I mean, cost-benefit gets around that. Cost-benefit gets around, you know, heterogeneity of preferences by using money 
as a common scale. But the problem is with that. The problem is that a money scale says that you know, the incremental dollar for Mark Zuckerberg is, is worth as much as the incremental dollar, right? So there's a real problem once we have an interpersonal index, and your proposal and the other paper was an interpersonal index, but then no, we're no, up no. against a problem of, of reconciling... So in the other paper, practices. we say very explicitly, you know, in the introduction, the conclusion, this is only, uh, this is partial, this is not complete. Why? Because we haven't solved the interpersonal comparability. So that paper is, uh, is pitched as an individual level index, right, right, and right. everything that I said to Carol, in the, at the individual level, in principle, I could, of course, I'll have an, an amount of data that is impractical to get from one respondent, because I'm talking about very long surveys. That, uh, okay. But um, we don't know how to, and you know, we're very explicit about that. So this is a piece of uh, an open question, how to actually now aggregate it across individuals. I have three people who signal to get a score. So, let's see how I, many just, uh, I didn't answer you. I mean, I can uh, answer oh. it later. With, no, no, I answer just, now okay. and then I'll I just start. didn't want to. Yep. So, I'll be very short. Uh, Eugene, you asked if, uh, okay, you found that the things don't coincide, but is it just uh, measurement or random noise, or can you tell us something more systematic? So, that's a great question because uh, it has a, a, a applicable uh, guidance. Uh, so I'll just give two examples that are consistent in all of our papers. One I already mentioned, family or significant others or others. Uh, we find consistently that you put more choice uh, on, uh, on, on the loved one's well-being, more weight on this in choice than you do in your own happiness. So my spouse's happiness will also increase my happiness, but in choice it gets much more than just through it, how much it will increase my happiness. And this is consistent, and the, you know, this is, we think, something that we have to look at, and then it opens a whole can of worms uh, philosophically, because to what extent should we consider your preferences about others and not just about yourselves, and double counting. Uh, the, the second example that I'll give uh, is uh, money. We find also consistently that people uh, underweight money in happiness, or overweight it in choice, or underweight in happiness. You know, it's a relative proposition. But uh, more money, you don't expect it actually to make you as as happier as you do put it to uh, give it weight in choice. And by the way, the two could be related. It could be that I care about my income well beyond how much I think it will make me happier because I have a kid and a wife, and so. Yeah. All right. So Dan, Alex. On their name, sorry, and then was there, and then Peter. Um, I have questions for both, but I'll just uh, ask for Ori. Both these papers are really cool. Um, uh, on the, I, I, I find your basic argument persuasive, but uh, do you have concerns about the the career choice, the residency choice, um, being uh, if that's the best sort of example for this sort of thing? Just because it seems to me. Um, it's actually, it's a little, there's an interesting question about what people's preferences really are in that kind of situation. Um, so in some sense, yeah, they are thinking about it and they would <coughs> prefer, but at another level, they may be uh, doing things that, you know, later on they come to regret because they go for the more prestigious uh, thing. Uh, they do what will be easier to justify. And so forth, and um, uh, and and so they may on their deathbed say, "God, I wish I'd taken that other residency." Um, and, uh, uh, and 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 there seems to be a common problem with career career decisions, in particular, having being married to a former Wharton MBA and watching my wife's classmates marching like lemmings into the uh, sorry, Matt, um, <laughs> into the meat grinder of um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, management consulting investment banking jobs. Um, and, and I, they would say, oh, well, I know I'll be miserable. I'm not going to do that. And they do it anyway. Um, and the other side of that is they might say they'd be less happy in one option. But maybe I, you wonder, and I, I think you know, hedonists would, would press this, that, well, maybe they don't really believe that. Maybe they really think they actually would be happier. And they're just saying, you know, because and they're really just going along with what uh, uh, is easier to justify to people, and that's that was actually I'm sorry that was actually my sense of the original Tversky and Griffin study where um, anyway. So in, uh, on an entirely different line, uh, so I was really interested in what you were saying, Matt, about uh, paternalism, and particularly the idea um, that 
when you include subjective well-being in some dimension as a, as a valued commodity and preferences, uh, that you can have an entirely non-paternalistic preference ordering where you're just outsourcing the, the need to order things to the individual. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about how that would actually be implemented when you step into policy. So, I mean, fundamentally, um, when you go from that, you know, theoretical step to actually implementing public policy based on gross national happiness or something like that, at the end of the day, it seems to me you can't avoid at some point saying, uh, you know, I'm an economist, I've run some regressions, I know how this policy is going to affect happiness on average and thus you know, dictate to some population, you know, this is what will on average happen to your happiness. This is how much it should be valued. This is how much we should value it compared to other things. So, I mean, I'd be just curious to what sense you think it's actually possible to take out paternalism from including subjective well-being in, in public policy. So my question is kind of closely tied to question one. Um, it's a technical question about the first slide. So in, the, in this slide, you seem to have two different questions, right? You, you ask like, people, what is your anticipated level of happiness? And then you ask them, what is your anticipated level of life satisfaction? Now, my concern is that asking those two questions kind of psychologically encourages a view of happiness that is a little bit more narrower than possibly you might want it to be. Because when you're asking it that way, you're, you're encouraging them to think of happiness as something that's conceptually separate from life, life satisfaction. Right? You're, essentially, you're saying that there's this kind of deeper psychological thing called life satisfaction, which is based on how successful a career you have, what's your health, so all, all these kind of objective measures. And then there's something, this, this, this cheery, hippie, floaty thing called happiness, which is, which should be different, right? If if you think possibly you could, you, you're, you're 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 even kind of encouraging the perception that if they're not different, there's something wrong with them. And a lot, of, I'm sure a lot of American high school kids can actually relate to this fact that you're encouraged to think of happiness as separate from success or anything or, or other things like that, and it, that creates a skewed view of happiness, which goes to to the first question of you know what, when they say they're not happy, are they actually not happy, or are they saying that simply because they think that's the proper thing to say? And then Peter, and then we'll let you guys respond. Yeah, the two great papers, and I wanted to ask a question uh, that kind of relates to both of them. But um, have were you, could you look at the question of how uh, preferences evolved? Uh, so, for example, uh, there's some evidence, I guess, that as people approach approach a choice, they tend to exaggerate their preferences in a way that would favor the choice that they're inclined to make. Uh, and so they start putting more weight on those factors than they would have done. So they look at people, you know, two weeks ago and ask them for their preferences about a stereo set or an automobile. Then they give them a choice. And uh, at just at the moment of choice, uh, they tell what their choice is and what their preferences are. And it turns out they've changed. And then if you look at them two weeks later, they've actually gone back to their original preferences, which might not have corresponded to the, the choice preferences, so to speak. And so... One problem, or, or one I interesting challenge here, and this is, I think, maybe something Matt would resonate with, is, you know, we want to look at choice as like a skilled activity to see how well people are doing, and there's a big problem of calibration. And, you know, if you're looking at a big choice, like a residency or something like that, it's very hard to calibrate. Um, and so you could imagine that preferences are evolving there to drive choice, but not in a way that's in reflecting some endogenous facts about the, the individual. Um, and so I'm just wondering, if, if you're looking at a longitude, I guess you're, most of your people expressed their <laughs> choices very late, but if you were to look at people over time and see if you can see a pattern of their preferences evolving in the direction of the choice that they make, um, and then sample them afterwards with a larger choice than a stereo set or something like that, would you get, would you get uh, a, an effect like this? And it seems like your, your kind of data would be useful for that kind of question because it, it, it should be a skill, you know, in, in which you get, uh, you're getting information from how you do it um, and um, trying to calibrate your ability to. All right, let me go ahead and catch that, yeah. So, yeah, so I'll respond to um, uh, Alex and also to Peter. I mean, so, yeah, Alex had paternalism right. So, so no, no one, well, it's possible to have a view which says that what's, what, you know, what's relevant are people's actual preferences. But if that were the view, your point is we would make policy not by you know, delegating to bureaucrats who use measures like GDP or cost-benefit, but simply by taking a national poll. 
right? I mean, the best way to figure out what people prefer, you know, well, with, with three more options, we're up against Arrow's paradox. But with two options, the best way to figure out is just to, to ask people what they prefer. We don't do that. So in effect, we're looking to well-informed preferences, right? Now, back to the theme that, again, it seems to me the real problem for preference-based view is heterogeneity. <laughs> so that answer is nice for the preferentialist in two ways. One, it says, is, well, no, 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 we're not looking to actual preferences, we're looking to well-informed preferences. And then the hope is that, you know, if we specify the conditions of being well-informed well enough, preferences will converge. We're not going to have, you know, 200 million preference organs, but just a few. But now we're back to the worry that you raised this morning about whether, in response to Walter, whether is it, is it the case that if people are well-informed with a procedural notion of well-informed, that they're all going to have the same preferences. And in a way, that's your question as well, right? It might be that people up against some choice just have different preferences as against people who are further away from the choice, right? I mean, Kahneman famously talks about something called the focusing illusion, right? Nothing is as important, right, as when you're focusing on it. Nothing, I mean, it seems as important later on, it doesn't, but at the time, it seems really important. So, I mean, I guess I'd say, yeah, so, I mean, it seems to me we, do need, to, we, we, we need to look to well-informed preferences there, even at the level of well-informed preferences, there might be divergences. There might be divergence between what people you know, prefer under good information when they're effectively in a poor state and effectively in a good state. There might be divergences between what people prefer when they're right up against the choice as opposed to uh, uh, backed off. I mean, my impulse, and I think it's, I think it's a very hard question for you know, preference utilitarians or well for economists, which are the same thing, what to do about that in terms of interpersonal comparisons. I mean, my impulse is just to pool which creates a kind of incomparability. But to say, well, you know, if we really have heterogeneous preferences, then the best thing is just the option which is best according to all of them or something like that, right? But I mean, that's not the conversation. But I do, I think, I, think, I guess the, the answer is that the most attractive kind of preference-based view appeals to good information. It's, it's moderately non-paternalistic, to go back to Alex's question, because it's possible that different people under good information might have differences. I mean, it's really still up to you, once we give you the facts, would you prefer. That does create dilemmas in terms of interpersonal comparisons because the anti-paternalism is also another way, to, another way to put this anti-paternalism is just to say that we might have heterogeneous preferences. Um, Okay, so the, so I guess then in, uh, Peter asked if I'm worried about uh, different aspects of uh, so I guess then emphasize the fact that it's uh, it's a big career choice and maybe it's special and a bad example. Uh, in some ways, I think Peter a little bit uh, interpreted this further and said, "Look, it's a one, if I understood correctly, it's a decision you make once in your life. Why would we assume that people are good at that?" Uh, they make it once, they never get feedback, they never do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm worried by both, uh, so I'm worried by these things. Uh, I had it on the last slide. This is just one data point. I wish, you know, I'd like to see 10 studies like that from different choices, from different contexts, uh, and try to gather a body of evidence that will, you know, that will uh, convince us that in fact it's not just career choices, it's also uh, with everyday choices. <coughs> Uh, it's mostly an empirical challenge. Uh, it would be very hard to get for everyday choices this kind of clean where you give me the rank and I know that you would have incentive not to lie on the. But uh, but uh, but hopefully this uh, you know this paper will encourage uh, more data collection effort and so that you know that's all I can say. I wish we have more data points because uh, yeah I'm worried when I see just one study it, it, it doesn't resolve the problem the the, the question. Um, uh, then there was a question on artificial uh, consistency, we call it. So uh, I'm asking them about happiness, second later about life satisfaction. I encourage some interpretation. Okay, so this is life satisfaction, excluding happiness, because I already asked about happiness. So in this data, we couldn't do much about it. It's only 500 people, but uh, in the previous paper, uh, what would you choose? What would, you, what would make you happier? Uh, we, that was a hypothetical question, so we had in principle unlimited pool of subjects. So we, we actually looked at that uh, in various, from various ways. Perhaps the cleanest thing was we had a between subject design where some people were only asked about happiness and some were only asked about life satisfaction. And uh, uh, we replicate, you know, so it, it, it's robust to that. Uh, it does change things a little bit. So we do find evidence that people 
we, we think, you know, there could be other explanations. We do find evidence at least consistent, I will make a weak statement, consistent with the idea that what other questions are asked on the survey could uh, change your interpretation, but <coughs> that alone cannot explain uh, the findings. Uh, um, I j I'll just say one last word. This context issue is a big problem for happiness uh, surveys in general. So we know mm -hmm. that which question you asked me before you asked me how happy I am with life could dramatically change things. And uh, the, these are issues that we, these are issues that bedevil uh, any use of the happiness data, even before, you know, we, we have to worry about it too. But in a way, uh, uh, these, these are big problems out there for anyone who wants to use this data. These data are not stable, uh, context dependent, etc. Right. Uh, any other people want to ask questions? Okay. Question there. So, so, Matt, I'm still struggling with this in some of the ways I, I was when you were presenting this work at a, our faculty workshop a year or so ago. Um, you know, as an outsider to this field, I, I, I feel as if there's still this kind of um, taxonomical problem that I'm not satisfied about what, what's being talked about here. So there's many ways to uh, articulate potentially the, the thing that, that's confusing me, but I thought one way to, one, one intervention uh, that, that I don't think we talked about last time you presented this work was and this may even be beyond the scope of your paper a little bit, but how do you deal with the fact that there seems to be a lot of evidence that people put a lot of effort into changing their own happiness functions? Uh, now, they wouldn't use that language, right? But I think, for example, a, a lot of religion is built around the idea of trying to engage in certain kinds of thinking and practices that will change your preferences for certain material things in ways that are believed, I take it, to potentially lead to a state of greater happiness. Because you will have a different happiness function than you had before you engaged in these practices, whether it be uh, forms of meditation, self-denial, uh, retreat, following uh, certain uh, uh, practices that are dictated by spiritual leaders. Um, you know, people are drawn into this as a way of dealing, I think, often with feelings of unhappiness in their lives that are associated with things that we might recognize in the terms of this conversation as, as hedonic measures of happiness. So I guess just, you know, one way to sort of push it at some of the taxonomy and boundary problems that I'm, I'm struggling with in these concepts is to say, how, how does that fit in this, this framework? How would you model that? So I guess my... One more question. Okay. Um, so my, my question is for, for Ori. Um, you know, so one interpretation of the of the data you have is that uh, happiness d doesn't predict choice very well, uh, and that some other unmeasured variable is could improve your prediction. Another interpretation is that there is something preventing people from making the choice that would make them most happy. So that can be you know heuristics and biases. That can be kind of self control issues. Um, you know, I think you kind of handled this as well as one study can. Uh, so as you think about how to move forward with this, with this research paradigm, another way to, to look at this and maybe rule out some other explanations is to look at uh, the exit as opposed to uh, you know, hiring the decision to take a job versus the decision to leave a job. Uh, in the management literature, we find that the things that cause people to take jobs are not the things that cause people to leave them. So. Uh, we, we consistently find that things like money and prestige uh, predict whether or not people take jobs m more so than what they think would make them happy or satisfied in the job. Uh, but when they leave jobs, the, the, the reasons they leave it are often not related to, ha to pay or prestige. 
Uh, it often has to do with the things that they said were important to them to begin with, which is things like, uh, you know, the people that I work with or, you know, the leadership there. And one explanation for that would be you don't have good indicators prior to taking a job of the things that would make you genuinely happy in that job. Uh, but once you've worked there, you have very good indicators, right? You, you know who your leaders and coworkers are uh, and whether or not you enjoy working with them. Uh, and so, you know, a, a, a way to rule out an alternative explanation if you, if you think that this is fundamentally a matter of uh, happiness doesn't explain job choice very well uh, is, you know, when people have good indicators of what's going to make them happy in a job, do they make the same choices? And so, you know, that probably wouldn't work with residencies because you leave because your three years are up. Uh, but, but in other contexts, you could begin to tease that apart. Do people have good information? One more related question coming here, and then you guys can talk. Actually, related to Matt's comment, I had a similar concern um, that maybe the choices in some way are constrained. Because you also found this effect of others' um, well-being entering the choice, or having explanatory uh, power for the choice. So it could be that those who are not single, they can't really choose freely, but they have to, go, you know, no matter how happy they would be in one place, they can't go there because of their partner. So you might want to just separate in the regression and just look at those who are single versus those who have a partner, and you might already find differences in how well subjective well-being helps explain the choice. Um, that'd be one way to do it. I just want to say, I just to be clear about the claim I'm making. I'm making a permissibility claim, not a necessity claim, and it's a claim about intrinsic preferences. I'm saying it's permissible, it's rationally permissible, it's intelligible, not required, but permissible for someone to have an intrinsic preference for something other than her own mental states, even in the broad sense of evaluated well-being and so forth, right? I'm not saying that someone must have that preference. It, it, it's also, I think, rationally permissible for someone to be a hedonist and care only about that, but I'm saying it's permissible. Now, so you say, I mean, I'm not religious, but let's, let's imagine, it's, so you say, well, lots of religions seem to teach people to do things that, in fact, increase their ha happiness. I mean, one question is, is that the content of what religion claims about, you know, what intrinsic preferences should be? I mean, I would have thought that religion says your intrinsic preference should be to, to do God's will. If you're really religious, then your intrinsic preference is to do what God has said you should do. It might turn out that will make you happy, but the content of the intrinsic preference is not to be happy. But let's suppose that's wrong. Let's suppose that religions or lots of religions indeed say to people, your intrinsic preference should be to be happy. I mean, that's not a problem from my view. That's perhaps rationally, um, I mean, you know, so I, I, I would say that's um, rationally permissible, but it's also permissible to have an intrinsic preference for things other than your own happiness. I mean, we observe at least in the world, people aiming at things, the hedonic, or more generally, the experiential benefit of which is suspect. I mean, people intrinsically seem to want to make more money. People intrinsically seem to want to be more educated. People intrinsically seem to want to have more liberties. People intrinsically seem to want to have bigger families. People intrinsically seem to want to have better health. All of those are not the best way to produce more happiness. Certainly not having, uh, you know, there's a lot of data, for example, that being more educated, you know, holding constant income does nothing hedonically, and yet, you, see, you know, there are plenty of people who want to be educated. So that's all I'm saying. I'm saying if one takes seriously a preference-based view, right, which, again, is a view that to some extent, at least building in full information, defers to people, it's up to people what they intrinsically prefer, and if they intrinsically prefer these non-experiential things, that's fine. And then, of course, we have to measure that. That's what utility theory does, right? But again, it's, it's simply to be clear about a certain project. Look to people's preferences, see what they fundamentally prefer, come up with a term called utility that measures that, right? And if there's variation, well, then that's a problem. But I'm not, so again, I'm not claiming that um, uh, um, uh, people must have an intrinsic preference for these non-experiential things just that they can, and so, you know, religious examples, if those examples are indeed, you know, uh, do indeed evidence experiential preferences are not really a counterexample from my view. So I love the emphasis on, uh, you know, on uh, asking what do people prefer and respecting that. Uh, this leads me to the, I guess, the questions about the specific study. So, uh, of course, we want a measure of preferences. Um, um, but what if people are constrained? Uh, 
confused. Uh, I'm a behavioral economist, so as Dan said before, we actually love, we love behavioral biases where people don't yeah. don't choose, you know, the right thing or the rational thing. So we try to study that. So um, all of these things are challenges for elicitation of preferences when choice does not reveal preferences. How to better do it? Um, a little bit of the answer is, uh, was the easy answer that I said before. We would like to get more data from more choice context. Uh, the, the exit thing, by the way, this is to me a fascinating fact. I didn't know that the set of things that are important when I choose a job. I know it's, it's probably true for me. Uh, I always tell my wife, you take a job because it gives you a higher salary. You quit a job because you get sick of the co-workers, yeah. right? It's never, it, it's a completely different set of, uh, yeah. so uh, intuitively, but I think it's fascinating. So we'll have to go back and to think of a context where uh, maybe we could actually run something like that. So that would be interesting. But, uh, but, but the kind of blanket answer is that uh, uh, we have to, to, to work hard uh, uh, study by study to convince ourselves the choice here is le legit or kosher. Uh, in this one, you know, we, we, we had a reason to believe that if, if there's any context where choice reveals preferences, that would be there's full information and cause <coughs> state and private and incentive compatibility. But of course, there are other worries that are special to this study. We, we will just need to look at more context. Um, specifically, uh, so two, two, two last things. One a little bit more on the philosophical approach. So at the end of the day, I think if we are liberalists and we want to look at preferences, uh, then at some level we will have to look at what people want to do and uh, we'll have to somehow deduce it, maybe not from choice, maybe from corrected choice with some model of biases, but uh, it's that versus... Uh, 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 versus uh, uh, some other alternatives, but we, we chose that uh, route here. Yeah, I'm not going to defend it, but this is the paradigm here, the working assumption. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is about spouses and relationships. So that's a specific bias that actually we can look at, and in fact we did exactly what you proposed in the paper. Uh, we excluded everyone in a relationship, which was two-thirds of our data. Uh, but uh, we so so we do report in the paper uh, only these guys only the single guys and so this is an easy one so as I said before study by study we try to identify the things that would make you deviate from choice and control for them but uh, we can't control for everything in, a, in every study. So we're supposed to end at four. And at four, um, there are cookies outside, I'm told, or cookies should be arriving. So, uh, and we'll reconvene at 4.30.